beginning, um, really we were just communicating when we were both in the same place and time. So if we had somebody we wanted to talk to, uh, grunt at, gesticulate at and wave our arms about at, um, we both had to be there in the same place at the same time in order to communicate. And so the history of communication is really how that we can extend that uh, beyond that meeting of two people. The first was looking at cave paintings and 3,500 years ago or thereabouts there were the very first cave paintings that we found where cavemen who were able to record particular events, hunts, uh, gatherings and so in this way communication was able to take place not necessarily at the same time it could be for future generations um, that could learn about things that had happened in the past. And so this sort of takes us through to writing, and the very earliest writing would have been cuneiform and hieroglyphics in the Egyptian and Mesopotamia regions, uh, what's currently Iran. And those writing systems developed, and as a result, more and more complex ideas were able to be communicated. And so again, we're using light and sound, well, we're sorry, we're using light waves here to transmit an idea but again the person who's writing it doesn't have to be there at the same time and place as the person receiving it there's this discontinuity there between those in another slightly different way um, where you have to be there at the same time but not necessarily at the same place is the use of smoke signals to send a message and we know that these were used by native american uh, people and also by the chinese at least as far back as um, 900 BCE, um, possibly further back than that. However, any kind of messages would have been quite basic originally. They wouldn't have been very complex messages. The first postal service where we could send some of the writings that have now been developed to people to send a complex message were developed in China um, nearly 3,000 years ago. And this meant that those more complex messages could be sent to somebody a long distance away and at a different time. So we're starting to stretch that communication now. Um, however, they can be quite slow because obviously the, somebody would actually have to travel with that message between the two people. Possibly a little faster, but not as possible to send quite such an involved message would be to use pigeons. and. It's been documented by Herodotus that um, this goes back to 776 BCE, um, where pigeons were used because of their homing abilities to send messages. And we can transmit information at a distance as well using um, coded flashes of light, a bit like Morse code. And this was definitely used by the Romans using mirrors to reflect sunlight um, at a particular person. Um, this might have been used from the shore to try and send a message to a ship. Um, it's not always possible for a ship to dock, and so it would be possible to uh, send a message that way. So moving on quite a way now to 1436 AD, we've got the Gutenberg printing press. And whilst we'd had books and so forth for a long period of time, they would have had to have been written out by hand, by often by monks who are literate enough to do so. And so if you wanted to communicate to a, a large number of people, then it would be very difficult to do. But the invention of the printing press means that suddenly we can create far more books, um, which can then be spread out, and that information can be sent to lots and lots of different people. And moving forward to Napoleonic times, a system of transmitting a message across a country was developed um, using an optical telegraph system and you can see here we've got a picture of a tower which has got a couple of arms at the top of it and these could be arranged into a particular pattern which would represent a particular letter and about 10 miles further down the road towards where the message was being sent there would be another tower with a similar system on the top and there'd also be somebody there with a telescope and they would be able to use their telescope to look at the, uh, the arrangements of the arms, and then they would be able to send the same message on to the next tower and so on. 
And so it was shown that you could send a message um, two or three hundred miles using this system and it would take about half an hour. It would be quite a simple message, maybe just a few characters long, maybe sort of 30 or 40 characters long, but you could send a message very quickly. And it was used to send messages from um, front lines of wars to um, the capital in Paris. Now this was the, um, the initial version of Semaphore, um, and Semaphore is um, a system of using flags. So system that used to be used quite regularly on boats to try and send messages um, again from boat to shore or boat to another boat um, using this flag system and the relevant codes. So, so far we're seeing lots of communications which are encoding a message into a different type of language, one that's not ordinarily sort of spoken or anything like that, but you can be change it from that code back into the original language that was being used to send it. So moving forward now to the 1830s, we've got the very first daguerreotypes, which were types of photographs. And here we're able to record light waves and store that image and then use the reflection from those photographs to um, show other people what uh, was happening in a particular place and time. Um, very much a case of rapidly increasing the, the rate at which information about different parts of the world was conveyed by taking photographs and then send them by post to other parts of the world. Um, whereas before it would have been paintings, paintings take longer, they require the artist to have a particular perception um, and you can't mass produce things, which you would be able to do with film. So moving on, um, the telegraph in, was developed by two people, uh, Joseph Henry, who was the inventor of the apparatus to send the message, and Samuel Morse, who devised the code that would be sent. And a telegraph was essentially a sequence of pulses of current that is sent down an electrical cable. And what Samuel Morse did the Morse code, where each letter would be represented by a dot or a dash, which is essentially a short or long pulse of electrical current which would travel down the cable. And this is the international version of the Morse code. Some countries did come up with their own version, uh, but this is the, the unified version, the ones that everyone would recognise. And uh, as an activity a bit later on, I'm going to get you to try and recreate some messages in Morse code uh, and send those to each other. And what a telegram would actually be like is that you would go to the, the post office and you would say, I want to send a telegram, you'd write it down, and then a person would key in the, the, the telegram into Morse code um, using a, a kind of little switch. It would be sent to the appropriate place for the cables, and then somebody at the other end would translate that back into um, English write it down on a card, and then that card would be posted to the particular person um, who it needed to go to. Um, and so you can see in this particular example, there's a telegram which was sent from Liverpool to uh, London uh, about the Titanic and um, those that had died and some of those that had been saved as a result. And in fact, the Titanic, the those people that were saved, it was all down to um, modern communications, in fact, not telegrams, but but uh, the wireless telegraph systems, which we'll see in a moment. Alexander Graham Bell was the inventor of the telephone and still using copper wires to convey electrical currents, but rather than pulses of current, he was able to devise a system using a microphone and a loudspeaker to send the actual voice sound audio to the other person. So the sound waves would cause a diaphragm to vibrate. That would cause a coil of wire to vibrate near a magnet, which would convert into electrical current, uh, which varied with the same frequency as the sound waves. And that would be able to travel down the cable, picked up at the other end um, by the receiver, and turned back into the sound waves. Now, if we think about all of the types of communications so far, they've all relied on light. 
this is the first one where sound is actually being used um, to convey information over the distance, albeit using electrical current in the middle. And the first sound recordings were from around about 1877. So Thomas Edison was the first inventor of um, a sound recording using a wax cylinder. And it was recorded onto that um, and then it was able to be replayed. And then shortly after that, the gramophone um, was also developed by, again, Alexander Graham Bell and the chap in this photograph, uh, Berliner. Um, so sound is becoming possible to be not only transmitted, but also recorded um, so that that information can be sent to um, distant people, uh, not necessarily wirelessly or through cables, but actually physically sending a copy of a gramophone record to somebody else. And then we're on to Marconi next. Um, now Marconi was um, an inventor who came from Italy and set up in the UK and wanted to use the newly discovered radio waves, which um, 10 years earlier were had just been discovered. And he wanted to send telegrams, not through cables, but wirelessly um, using these radio waves. So he was able to develop a system to, to do this. And gradually through experimentation, he was able to send these radio waves further and further um, and sending a message. And in fact, he was the message across water. And this is a picture of Flatholm, which is in the Bristol Channel, not very far from where we are in the UK. Um, and he was able to send it from South Wales across to this island. And then five years later, he was able to send a message not just over a few miles, but over thousands of miles across the Atlantic in 1901. Um, so this was a great way of not being restricted to cables, but being able to send messages over long distances without that restriction. The only trouble is that um, those messages could be intercepted by other people. The first time it was possible to send audio uh, wirelessly was just a few years later. And uh, this chap called Fessenden, uh, who was a Canadian inventor, Archibald Fessenden, um, sent a voice recording from uh, where he was transmitting to nearby boats, which were just off the coast. Uh, and he uh, gave a little audio performance. He uh, played his, I think it was a guitar, um, to the people on the boat that, that they could listen to. Um, but the quality not great at this time, and he was using a form of um, transmission called amplitude modulation. And that's a bit of a mouthful, but essentially is where the high frequency radio wave, which is shown in blue here, um, would carry the audio wavelengths. And so essentially the his audio was turned into an electrical signal combined with the radio wave and that caused the radio wave's amplitude to vary in accordance with the sound wave. So you can see in the red wave at the bottom, the frequency remains the same, but the amplitude goes up and down and it goes up and down at the same rate as the initial black wave at the top, which is the sound wave. And it would be then possible to receive that radio wave and extract that amplitude change as a sound wave and then play it back. And this is the simplest way of sending a sound wave using radio waves, um, but it's not great quality. Um, it has, suffers from a lot of interference. Um, so it's not necessarily the best way, even if it is the simplest way. We still there are still some radio stations that broadcast uh, using amplitude modulation, but they tend to be talk radio stations or sports um, stations that are just commentating on particular sporting events so that the quality is not quite so important. Uh, Virgin Radio is one example. Um, the frequency here, 1215, 1215 kilohertz is the frequency of the radio waves which it broadcasts at. And you can see at the end it says AM, which stands for amplitude modulation. So there's another type of um, broadcast, which is frequency modulation. And this was first developed in 1933. 
And instead of changing the amplitude of the carrier wave, the radio wave, the sound wave was used to change the frequency of the carrier wave. So you can see in this example where the black wave, which is the sound wave at the top, has a peak, the frequency of the red wave at the bottom becomes higher. And where there's a trough, the frequency becomes lower because the wavelengths got longer. So as the frequency of the sound wave changes, it changes the, sorry, as the amplitude of the sound wave changes, it changes the frequency of the radio wave that's carrying it. And again, this can be picked up at the other end by the receiver and that sound wave information extracted from that carrier wave and played back as a sound wave through the speakers. So slightly more complex um, electronics to actually achieve this, um, but the quality is much, much higher. Um, it doesn't suffer from interference so much. And particularly after the Second World War, where there was a lot of um, use of the AM spectrum of radio waves, this started to become used a lot more for radio stations. Now, well ahead of its time, um, pulse code modulation was um, invented and patented back in 1938, but not particularly used until um, many years later, probably 40 or so years later, maybe even 50, with the advent of computers. And that's because the pulse code modulation is using pulses of uh, radio waves or pulses of current, a bit like telegraphs in some way, some ways. Um, and this is the sort of digital information which would be used by computers. So let's go forward for uh, quite a few years. And the very first satellite communications were in 1962. And a satellite called Telstar was put into space just five years after the very first satellite was uh, Sputnik was put into space. And suddenly we were already using it for communication. It was used to broadcast television. Um, it was used for telephone conversations, for transatlantic um, communications in particular. So it was possible to have a transatlantic broadcast, possible to have a conversation uh, using this um, to telephone across the across the globe. Um, and as well as being set up for uh, as well as having the satellite set up at this to set up a number of receivers across the world. And this is Dean Hilly Down in Cornwall, which is was deliberately built for these um, satellite communications. So moving forward, um, fiber optic communications became possible in 1975 with the development of much, much more pure glass fibers in order to transmit the information without loss with the advent of lasers that could actually send pulses of light through this with just one frequency which was important um, i'm not going to go into the technicalities of that but um, we will be looking at fiber optics as a method of communication